All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode of the London Is Blue podcast. As always, here's Brandon, my host, Nick and Dan. And gentlemen, we brought in a guest for the Brentford match review because it wasn't going to be fun without one, right, Nick? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're running out of ideas here, folks. So we uh, we thought, hey, no one better to bring back onto the pod for the first time in a long time. It's been a while. Uh, football therapy, you may know him as that. You may know him as Yan. You may know him as the guy who has consistently evaded getting a Croatian flag tattoo on his ass from a bet long gone by um, due to Mateo Kovacic. You may know him as all of those things. Yan, welcome back to the London is Blue podcast. Thanks, guys. Yeah, very happy to be back. When I was <laughs> when I was originally asked to be on, right, it was before the result. And I had this big idea in my head, like, you know what, I could do this big return speech. Like, I had a kind of like Lord of the Rings, like Yandalf has returned at the turn of the tides. <laughs> they were going to come back in. Everything's going to be good now. But still turgid crap. So here we are. And I can't wait to, you know, get into it with you guys. Well, look, the effort is is noticed and we we see you we appreciate you so everybody uh go go ahead up yeah and tell much you enjoyed this podcast especially with the situation that we're in but look we're going to take uh a in -depth, an in-depth view of the of the trip to the g-tech community stadium not far from the bridge uh only minutes away got a point not what we needed but before we kick it off before we go in there we got to see dan what the people are saying with our three-word match review. Absolutely. There were a lot of gifts this week, too, and that was a bit of a gift to me considering the result. P. Miller, CFC, with bottom half blues. Nate with what we doing, which I'm going to go to what we doing, maybe, or dooning. You had Caleb Messer, good friend of the pod, with perhaps too carefree, question mark. <laughs> Pilo with this is us and they use a gif of someone dropping down a serving platter in the middle of the table to define a mid table serving up delicious points probably to another team. I am the franchise with Poch has aura and that's of being Spursy. You had Greg the ginger with Chelsea be better double E blue badger with stung yet again and Josh Huffins with a classic wicker man Nick Cage. So not the bees, not the bees, not, not the, the bees. bees. <laughs> that shouldn't be a recurring theme with us, man. Why do I recognize this coming up every fucking time? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I said denying Brentford's double, Yan. The World War II was the last time they'd done the double over us. And, oh, yeah, uh, we I were had that one able... going around, yeah. Fuck. Yeah, so hey, big day out. We denied Brentford's double, all right? Like, big day out. Dan, what about you? Look, I, I like a good Dune-themed one because that is exactly what I'm going to do after this and I'm going to say collapsing like Atreides because uh, we felt a little bit like the, the proper house did in this moment. We had an opportunity to take it and, you know, we, we left the sand. Nick? A lack of belief. Mm -hmm. Go home. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I'd like, don't be mad because I had the best one until Yan trumps me here. Let's go. Yan, save us. Stop stinging Yannick. I just care about me and the pain's too much. So, <laughs> you know. To be fair, I don't think we've talked about what this means for us. I feel like that's a good point. You know, we've always looked at at Chelsea, mm. and realistically, we should probably turn around and look at ourselves because we're the ones going me? through this on a weekly yeah. basis about as me. well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Nick, run us through uh, before we get into it. Just run us through ways people can engage and support us. Yeah, well, support our mental health just by we uh, need it. by helping us uh, on uh, five star reviews on Apple and Spotify. Of course, subscribing on YouTube. Uh, Yan also has an, what forty five channels now. Yan, you have eighty. Thereabouts, mate. Say, yeah, okay. Uh, football therapy is the main one, though. So go subscribe to his channel. Subscribe to our channel. Um, obviously, the dispatch. I. Sam's been putting out some bangers. The 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 team hasn't recently, but Sam has. So I would subscribe to the London's Blue Dispatch. You can just search that very easily. And then, of course, if you want to do a paid option, you can always join us in Discord. Uh, I I did a little post game madness yesterday, and uh, it went about as well as you would have thought. So <laughs> uh, it was fun. 
Uh, yeah, I was in there all match, and I tell you what, it was good until it wasn't, and you know exactly when it became not good, and I understand. So anyways, let's jump in here. It was Brent for this past Saturday, the 2nd of March in the Premier League at the GTEC Community Stadium. Casey missed it. Brentford 2, Chelsea 2 as well. Nico Jackson getting the opening goal in the 35th minute. Rorslev in the 50th minute equalizes Wiesa with an overhead kick, taking the lead in then 83rd minute. Cold Palmer uh, to DeSassi, saving our bacon. Dan, what was the lineup to get us there? Well, look, you can see the four shadows of Antonio Conte and Thomas Tuchel with a, standing over Mauricio Pochettino's shoulders with a back three. That's right. Petrovic comes back in the lineup, but it's Levi Colwell, Trev Chalba, and Axel DeSassi as your three center backs with Malagusto, Ben Chilwell's wing backs, Enzo Fernandez, Moises Caicedo, and Connor Gallagher as your midfield, and then Nico Jackson and Cole Palmer as your attackers. Only two subs, which we will certainly talk about, of Mikhailo Mudrik and Raheem Sterling, 71st minute and 79th minute, respectively. Only one goalkeeper on the bench, Robert Sanchez, Chago Silva, Gilchrist, Kukurea back, long time away, making his return to the bench. Cassidy. Uh, Tatrin and Madueke all make the bench and are unused. Uh, let me help Jimmy Terranen. Terranen. I tell you what, there's a lot of vowels in there, Jimmy. There's uh, a little well vowels. Would there's you like to buy one? U's and A's and I's all over the fucking place. E's even, if you want them, go for it. <laughs> yeah, he's so, going. So, <laughs> Some of the top line stats here. Uh, Chelsea with 1.81 XG to Brentford's 1.83. Ended up leveling. We had to catch them for most of the match. We had 68% possession with 17 shots, 6 on target, to their 14 shots with only 5 on target. We had from there, let's see, 9 fouls to their 10. We got the 1 caution to their 3. Big chances, which we always love to lead with here, is two for the Chelsea, only missed one. Feeling pretty good about that. Brentford, the same, had two, and they missed one. One random stat from Squawka coming in saying only two players have provided five or more assists in the Premier League for Chelsea this season. It's Cole Palmer and Malo Gusto. That's interesting since Cole Palmer joined right before the season and Malagusta joined in the summer as backup to Reese James. But Yannick, between the lineup and the stats, what stood out to you? Oh, man. Okay, so the big talking point, of course, is the actual back three. I think everyone was sweating when they saw the lineup and they were just building this, you know, this starting 11 with Chilwell at left wing. Um, understandably, because there's only real two proper forwards there. So everyone was bricking it, I think. And it was kind of refreshing to see a legitimate back three. Um, of course, this is the first Premier League start for Trevo Chalaba, who's being reintegrated, and there ain't no safer, warmer place than the middle of a back three in a starting lineup uh, for when you play football. So him have flanked by a right footer and a left footer. Gusto's been playing really well. Yeah, we want to see him at wing back. You know, he can cook more. Nice. Chilwell won the Champions League as a wing back. And then you've got a little bit more of a flat midfield three. And two most effective attackers up top. I looked at um, this uh, X value uh, website I use for stats. Um, it's like a, I was looking at it today actually for a, a video, and all of our uh, offensive metrics are dominated by Nicholas Jackson and Cole Palmer, like no one else. And uh, so I understand why you put those two up top. And in theory, I understand, you know, maybe matching Brentford and trying something out in this game. But you could also say it was maybe lacking bravery, but that might be a hindsight 2020 thing, you know. But I, I was okay with it, as was many, I think. Go on, Nick. This, this was something that I was excited about when I saw it, because especially when I saw it, like, deployed once the game started, because I, too, yeah. thought, you know, originally that this would be kind of a 3-5-2 or a 5-3-2, whichever way you were kind of in, in and out of possession, and yeah, I think it maximizes what, what Gusto and Chilwell can do. I think it does limit a little bit what the midfield can do, but that's okay. What it really does is allow you to drop players back because you know all they want to do is counterattack with numbers. Like that is their entire game plan under Thomas Frank because they are not a supremely talented team. Mm. So if you have numbers and you can match up and you aren't getting blitzed past like we were at the bridge earlier this season, then... To me, this is like, okay, lesson learned. Nice job. Like, you you have identified what they were going to do, Maurizio. 
and you're trying to deploy a balanced, a more balanced lineup and a more balanced strategy. And I thought for the first half, it worked like a fucking charm. I thought it was great. Um, you know, they had one shot and it was off target in the first half. It was, they had nothing. They couldn't, you know, attack with width. They couldn't attack through the midfield because Caicedo was dropping back. And I thought in possession, we finally started to work our way through it. It's, you know, of course, we're going to talk about the problem second half, which is, you know, a consistent theme this year where it kind of all fell apart. But yeah, Brandon, I was, I was really pleased, honestly, with the first half and the way that it looked. Well, yes, that, that, that was when things were good. No doubt. Uh, you, again, not having an MPET shit house moment of the match, Nick, I mean, for you is, are we starting to see a pattern of the identity of this team? I know a lot of us as fans look for this type of edge. Um, we've seen it in other matches, but it's just been so inconsistent. Um, like there, there are some matches where it's like, it feels real, you know? And then there are some matches like this, the goal celebrations today just felt so out of sync with where everyone was at the, at those moments where I'm like, I guess technically th those are, but you know, it just, I think the vibe was so down for, for the leveler that I was like, I don't know, man. Like, the only one I, I called out to you was the way that Petrovic handled the ball very, very close to the edge of the box that felt like a <laughs> yeah, absolute that is moment true. of shithousery. <laughs> Love that. That is Love true. That. Okay. I, it, I would give it to Petro. He's He's been good at least. Um, it rem it just reminds everybody that the rules don't really apply to us in the goalkeepers union. I think that was what was important <laughs> to take from that moment. <laughs> No yeah, I would, okay. I, you know what, Dan? I'm, I'll give you this week's shit ass moment of the match. Well and done. I would say to balance it out, Flucken towards the end went and punted one long, and he was at least three feet outside of his box when he let it fly. That's another rule that the the, the Premier League has just oh, abandoned. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. all right, we're going to take a first half break. Quickly, okay. so, sorry, just, just quickly on Flucken before I forget it, there was that great moment where he chopped back against Nico Jackson. Everyone went, way for him just to kick it out to touch immediately, which I really enjoyed. <laughs> I think he gave him the big and I'm like, oh, look who he thinks he's the big man. Oh, look, he screwed up. So that was a lovely moment for me. I tell you what, the regression in footwork from Raya to Flecken is significant. <laughs> like, um, yeah, yeah he, he punted a couple out that were, were pretty poor. So, uh, all right, yeah. little little shithouse for Flecken too. I love it. All right, so you're going to take our first break. When we get back, uh, talking about the tale of two halves because this match was one in a different one. We're thinking of sponsors and we'll be right back. All right. So as Nick was alluding to uh, right before we transitioned here was the f how good the first half was. Uh, Danny put it in here that we stalled in the second half because the stats become very opposite. I do like how Sofa score allows us to split it between first half, second half and the entire match. I think, Dan, this is where you love to lean in to really point out those differences, especially I think with this Chelsea side, we have been. Um, Jekyll and Hyde on, you know, whatever happens at halftime is, I think at this point, a concern for us supporters and fans, and we need to figure out what's happening. So I don't know if you want to kind of look at the differences here, but it is night and day different they, yet they again. Need, they need to write a medical case study as to what happens in the Chelsea dressing room before and after half. Like there should be some sort of like, is there like they put in like sleepy time tea in everyone's cups for like what is happening, Dan? Nick, I'm sure a big four consulting firm would love to take the job <laughs> off of Chelsea's hands to investigate the uh, and model a presentation around what they should do uh, and during halftime and in the second half of matches. Yeah, when you look at in the first half, Chelsea had 1.24 expected goal, 71% possession, six total shots, three of those on target. Then you flip to the second half, we had 0.57 XG, 64% possession, nine total shots, only three on target. And it was the exact opposite for Brentford. Brentford, first half, 0.43, 29% possession, four shots total, one on target. You flip it in the second half, they had 1.4 XG, 36% possession, 10 total shots, four on target. Uh, and then they also hit the woodwork as well twice during the second half too. So I actually thought it was really interesting to kind of say like, hey, let's just look back at larger situations, like the entirety of the season. So a first half table, first 45 minutes, and a second half table, second 45 minutes of the game. Chelsea would be in eighth in the first 45 minutes with a plus six goal differential, 39 points. You flip it. If we just played second halves of games, 
and this is just to show like where the standard is, we would be in 17th with a negative five goal difference on 24 points. We, <laughs> we have that is allowed fucking crazy. That's we have allowed 26 stuff. goals in the second half of matches. We only allow 15 goals in the first half of matches. We have scored 21 goals in the first half, and we have scored 23 in the second half. So it is a problem of conceding goals in the second half is the large, large issue here that has not gotten fixed. Wow. And I think that a lot of this ties down to fitness, and, you know, the player availability, the substitutions and when they happen, the decisions with how we decide to play, because when we press, we do a really good job. And when we decide to take our foot off the press, we don't do a good job. And so I don't know, Yan, like, I mean, this is what I'm walking away with, but ultimately it feels like we know what the problem is. There's not an easy straight solution, but you can see how you might want to start to try to fix this. Sure. And it's funny, right? Like, cause certainly I can remember being a Chelsea fan at times um, and just being better in the second half, like calling yourself second half FC. Certainly I know loads of, fans of uh, certain clubs have been in that position and they're like oh why can't we just start the game like this they're all so nervy and unsettled in the first half and it's kind of like weird to be in the opposite you know uh, position to start the half really well and do well and then do really bad like but the thing is it's not even like when they're super gassed at the end of the half like in terms of like fatigue it's literally out of the tunnel when you should have had a little bit of revitalization so it's almost at least chiefly for me, it seems like psychological over like physiological. I can see Nick's nodding there. So I think you <laughs> coming in, coming well, it's, in it's after like, that, mate. It's like they have the motivational poster wrong where it's like, yeah. it's not how you finish. It's how you start. You know, it's like yeah. that, yeah. that is, it's, it's crazy to me because you're exactly right. Like I made the point on Wednesday's pod that in no point this season outside of like some really key outliers like Manchester city, where I thought we played, a really good match and you know the the leveler there is like something that just kind of happens and i can accept that one right because they're really mm-hmm. good and we're we're not so good but we just don't start periods of play well at all and then we'll we'll go through this like oh we're growing into it and then the fall will happen and then we're growing into it and then the fall will happen it's like it's not even like there's a a really clear pattern in my brain other than we're just going to start slow and then we'll figure it out from there because like even think about this game raheem sterling has a chance at the end to go win it right out of nowhere like you're down a goal and then you could have through a a break and a a kind bounce go through and just finish that chance and then win the game and kind of steal one and again that doesn't make a ton of sense you think about the way that we finished at selhurst park a couple weeks ago score a couple late goals, put it away, make a a really kind of shit result seem a lot better. It's so wavy. Like, I don't understand what this team does at all, Yan. So I I just wanted to, like, compliment you on that analysis because I I think you're right. I just don't get it. Yeah. Can I just – I know I understand we're talking about first half, second half, but it kind of goes goes into this as well because there is this sort of psychological frailty inexperience lack of maturity and i just wanted to i wanted to say this because i've said it on on my match review and stuff and that is how i feel like so i understand you're probably going to go through the goals in a second but just quickly on Johan this goal right he scored a screamer an overhead kick right i was saying we can only dream of having a player with that confidence and experience to finish like that now why, when I say or that, attempt? Yannick is saying, yeah, well, yeah, but, or attempt, but Yannick's saying, right, this is what Yannick's saying, third personing myself here, that <laughs> Chelsea, the billion pound bowly bottler boys, right, or whatever you want to call them, we could only dream of having a finisher like Brentford's third choice striker, <laughs> right? Now, deep that, brothers and sisters at home, right? Brentford, where did they buy Johan Visser from? Probably when they're in the championship, probably cost absolutely nothing, but he's a big boy and he's a grown up and he's like, yeah, I'm just going to overhead kick this in the Premier League, you know, and we can only dream of that, you know, and the, the, where the money has been funneled and I get it, it's a long-term portfolio investment scheme, but at the end of the day, you need a grown up on the pitch that is the third fucking choice striker. He's behind in Buemo and Tony at Brentford. And he's just for the 15th showing, best team in the league. For the 15th best team, thank you. Let's keep preaching. 10 million and, do you know what I mean? euros. and we could only 
There you go, Dan. There you go, Dan. I mean, that's probably more than I thought it would be, but still. Orient. still like, yeah, yeah. Well, comparatively, though, do you know what I mean? That's like nominal, and it's just because he's a grown up. Do you know what I mean? And I feel like with the, you know, that with the finishing, the moments, seizing the moments. Raheem Sterling's not that character. He's a system player that plays well in a good team. If we're going to go with vibes and individuals for the moment, which seemingly we are, you need a few grown ups on that pitch. That's going to go. Actually, I'm going to try this you know, and score. But the young Chelsea forwards, they all get in the final third 18-yard box and they all just go, <laughs> and, you know, and this is, yeah. Anyway, you know, Brandon, and that, that, is, is, that be... is demonstrated. Yeah, that is demonstrated in the psychology of the two halves as well. So it's relevant. Go on. Brandon, this was going to be a point that I, I made to you because I think, you know, you, you've played. It's almost as if the opposition, the minute they come out for the second half, can sense we're nervous and like half a level, full level up based on that nervousness. And, and they like, we turn fucking Johan Vissa into prime Ronaldo <laughs> for, for 30 minutes of the second half. You had Johan Cruyff right in front of you. <laughs> oh no, damn it. You're right. <laughs> ah, fuck. Yeah, yeah. Like what, what the hell is yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, well, look, I, there, it's, it's a, a bad habit that other teams have paid attention to, but it's also, I think, a rallying of of the the Brentford manager as well, Thomas Frank, knowing that they're down one nothing. They have they're at home, right? Like they have something to go after. So then, my concern is like, okay, is Chelsea not combating the very obvious thing that Thomas Frank is going to go in there and demand more of those players, especially when they come out in the halftime? You get 15 minutes. A lot of these players they get a fresh kit. Right? I don't remember if it was raining at halftime or not, but they come in, they get a fresh kit, they get a kind of hit reset, and it literally is like a chance to erase or change things that have happened. We saw Tom Strang, he's got his big notepad down there. That's his thing. He's He loves to change things. And uh, they came out and did that, whereas I don't know how it's not, at least, I think Poch, like this isn't an old team. Lee Parker keeps tweeting it out, right? It's like a 23 the average squad was 23 and a half years for Chelsea today. Normally, Poch probably doesn't have to say that because that's obvious. But with this group, you can't take anything for granted. You have to remind them, hey, they are going to come out. You need to be defensively resolute for the first 10 minutes. I think the majority of goals go in like five minutes before halftime, five minutes after halftime. We all know that stuff, right? The first five minutes after someone concedes, you're probably going to concede again. And we just miss those little things. And a lot of it comes down to, I think, that age and things like that. But that is an easy conversation to have. One thing that Poch did say is a bit of a part is a bit of a problem is that they're not being able to uh, recover, especially in the midfield. Naz tweeting the quote says from Poch, "We don't have the possibility to refresh the players in a key area." Talking about the midfield, um, Dan, you want to push back? I think a little bit because Cassidy was on the bench, Tiago Silva's on the bench, which could have given you flexibility. Maybe put Trevor Chalaba up ahead. Um, we only made two subs in total, though, so we'll have to go from there and. Again, I can't emphasize enough, ladies and gentlemen, you have to go to YouTube to watch this video because Dan <laughs> just sent the balloon gestures. And it yeah. happened. I, Come on, I Dan. No idea. Dan's no idea excited about this. Uh, well, yeah. I'm, I'm not excited Enjoy that we're not smile. using all of our subs. <laughs> um, ultimately, yeah, I, I just think it's it's a rough situation to say that you don't have the players when you, know, you also could go to the academy and I'm saying I'm not saying that like they're meant to be starters right but do you need someone for 20 minutes to just run and add some enthusiasm add some energy with 10 other senior players on the pitch like would that be a better option than grinding players into nothingness in terms of their energy output to get pushed around by some of the players on, on Brentford like and you know getting creative is what you know in situations you hope a manager would do and say hey I know it's not perfect. I know I don't have all the players I want. I know I'm not happy with some of the attackers I have. I know I'm not happy that I don't have an option to go to the bench and bring someone on. Well, then you're the person who picks the bench. You're the person who's saying, these are the players I want to go lean on in these moments if I need to find someone to bring in to freshen up this side. And so I think that's just me. It's kind of baffling that we say, on one sense, hey, we're, we're going to go out, we're going to be competitive, and like I'm going to set the team up for success. And at the same time, I'm not going to find a composition on my bench that allows me to say at 65 minutes when I know this team is getting to the point of getting gassed 
that maybe I should go ahead and plan a substitution to get one of my midfields out, midfielders out of there who is struggling, who is regressing in terms of how competitive they can be on the ball. They're getting a little sloppy, getting passed by. They're making poor challenges. Like, like You can see it happening. And I think that was the most maddening part for me, Nick, is that you saw it happening in real time and nothing was being done. You didn't see necessarily a ton of players warming up. You didn't see a lot of movement on the bench. It was just an acceptance of it happening. That thing is the real questionable slash maddening element of it all. We sent a couple of guys on loan too, that could be useful for this team. Like you, in my mind, Lavi is not playing the rest of the season. He's just not been available. So you, he played what? 30 minutes this year. I mean, just like take, one match. Yeah. Take, take the net average of it. Lavi is not playing for us this year. Right. And I don't know what happened to Leslie Ugochukwu at all. And that's been a mystery. Ask Matt about that next week. But, like, you have Santos on loan. You have Matos on loan. Like, you you could have kept those guys around as just relief pitching, essentially. You're, you, you know, you don't have to, like Dan said, you don't have to start them. But Gallagher looks completely gassed right now. And he is the most fit player in the squad. And if and if he's the most fit player in the squad and he's gassed in March on March first, what the hell is he going to look like in April? What the hell is he going to look like in May? Like you're telling me, we can't string together a better combination of player. Like Enzo's performances have been terrible lately. I think it's because he's still managing an injury. He's still you know getting used to the league and physicality and all that stuff. Even Caicedo is, you know, I think he's doing okay. He's probably you know, maybe the fittest of the three of them right now, but you can't just keep playing that. Yeah. And like it, it, you need to do something different. And and as Dan said, you're the manager, you have all the power to make this change. Yes. A hundred percent. And um, I'm mindful. We're going to talk about some of Pochettino's quotes in just a moment. Uh, some other stuff that he was reacting to after speaking about the fitness of his midfielders. He, um, and also where the hell is this like, Fabled Maurizio Pochettino, coach, coach of, manager of embryonic toddlers. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? That like brings in all the children and makes them good. It makes you, you know, it does make you think. Like he probably thinks right. Then the average of my team's like all twenty three, and these are like the the senior expensive new buys. So I've got to do. I've got to channel all my like child minor ed, mind energy into to the whole team at the moment. So maybe he can't bring in these like you know one or two Delhi Ali types and make them a superstar. And you know, I mean, I can moan about that for ages. I spoke about the you know what happened about the arm around Mudrick. I, I think he's. I think he just feels too thinly spread right now, Pochettino, in terms of what he felt, what he's meant to be good at as a coach. I feel like. It's not like, oh, we've got this team, but use your Pochettino superpowers for these two youngsters. It's like, no, the whole freaking place is a kindergarten and, you know, go for it. But um, yeah, I do have sympathy for him. Not that much. I feel like I agree with you guys. Um, uh, he should he should probably utilize the development squad a little bit more. But at the same time, I wonder if there's external pressure from the ownership, from sporting directors of seeing a return on investments um, making them work sooner rather than later and integrating with the team. But yeah, like uh, um, Brandon, I feel like maybe a little bit more telling is is how the pressure he's feeling. So maybe he feels like he needs to play the first team as a, a little bit more. And I think that could be, um, you know, heard as well from his talking about what was chanted at him yesterday in the GTEC Stadium, which was, you know, starting to get pretty ropey. For sure. I think two things I'll say before that is one, we used to get some pretty detailed injury updates. Now it's copy paste. Benoit, Carney, yeah. <laughs> Wes, Reese, Romeo, Leslie are all quote, continuing to undergo his rehabilitation program and quote, and Kunku it's a triggering who, sentence for me that it is it. Yep. Yeah. And Kunku is just undergoing rehabilitation program, AKA restarting for the fourth time, a rehabilitation program. So they've dumped, uh, they've just given up on kind of like, giving insight where people are at because it's just a mess. Um, the other thing is, you guys remember uh, Blue Fuel launched by Chelsea Football Club? It's folded. So, yeah. Cool. The Hardly whole sports knew. nutrition recovery. Yeah. Um, 
the it's all gone. So I tried to go to the Blue Fuel website and it is down. So I guess that might be a sign of where things are going. Uh, Nick, you said this a while ago about halftime. If they're giving them sleepy time tea, they're not giving them those energy gummies. Maybe we need to bring no. it back. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, we're going to take our last ad break. When we get back, uh, Potch's quotes and the fans' response in the stadium. So thank you to the sponsors, and we'll be right back. All right. So to kind of put a wrap on this one a little bit is Potch came out after the fact and, um, you know, gave us his reality of the situation. So he says, quote, we need to manage the reality. We are working really, really hard to try and win games. The team is fighting. I think in six days, we played 120 minutes on Sunday. Wednesday was another tough game. And then some decisions because of injuries or some circumstances. End quote. I don't know. Yannick, that's a, that's a bit of a non-starter for me. Like, I, it doesn't say much. Uh, I do know that we are very thin. We obviously know that we had to play extra time in the cup final, which is another 30 minutes. Had to play yeah. Leeds midweek. But, you know... <sighs> Yeah, the sympathy, look, man, Chelsea for the whole season deserve a great deal of sympathy. Um, maybe not, <laughs> look, Pochettino does in that sense because we've had like profound amounts of injuries, uh, key players, you know, the, the external footballing world will have sympathy because it will be like sort your frigging medical team out and stop, you know, stop getting lavia injuries and training on wet grass or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like this kind of stuff. No one will have external sympathy. I had a little bit of sympathy, but... To you know, to what you guys' general consensus is, yeah, man, Cassidy, you know, on the bench. We brought that guy back from Leicester, who's cup tied. Can't even play against them in the next FA Cup round. You know, he's not just not featuring. He's he's a useful player. He is. It's very uh, it's very difficult, but you're starting to see um, not no not so much with his demeanor, Pochettino, because he's still holding. You know being like a sort of, he's still maintaining a little bit of his aura, you know, something that po uh, Graham Potter was lacking. But in terms of his actions, and this is, to be honest, with Chelsea managers, this is usually the the start of the end when their actions become a little bit desperate, whether it's like, you know, fielding people on the bench that shouldn't be there or overcooking players in this sense, you know what I mean? So I just feel like maybe the, maybe finally the pressure's getting next to, uh, getting to him despite you know, positive conversations internally, maybe residing in the bottom half of the table, the manner of the cup final defeat, regardless, you know, the defeat itself in isolation isn't bad. And actually, like, before this game, because this is a shit result, it just is, right? Um, considering the form they're in. Before this game, I was looking at Chelsea's results since the end of last year. And actually, in isolation, they're not that bad. Like in terms of who we're playing, I know we got touched up at Anfield, and the Wolves' result was really bad. But other than that, like you know, they were good. You know, things were fine. Even the Liverpool final, you know, if you look at the stats and the context, that was okay. And then we beat Leeds. We like rebounded from an emotional, you know, disappointment with a uh, against a form team that are used to winning in Leeds. You know, that was fine. I I wasn't that negative about. That. I was like, yeah, fine. You know, like Leeds. The old enemy, the Stanford Bridge would have liked that last minute winner. That's fine. This for me was the oh moment. Do you know what I mean? Like oh no, we are, we are actually quite shit. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And like I, I kind of knew it in, in loads of ways, but there was um for me that was like the moment when I'm where it was like a sobering affirmation of a terrible scenario right now. And maybe maybe Poch is sort of starting to creak a little bit and uh, hence the overcooking of midfielders and hence these comments as well um uh, dan yeah i mean he he got a earful from the away supporters uh you know let's just say there were calls for former ownership there were calls for him to f off there were calls for jose Mourinho in particular there were yeah, you know, very, uh, very explicit comments directed towards uh, individual members of the ownership group. I mean, it just not the attitude that you would love an away support to have. And I mean, look, there were also chants from Malagusto that you could hear, which was great as he had he individually had a very good day out. Like it, that is usually another telltale sign of when things are going wrong, when things are going bad, when the aura changes from positive to desperation is when you have you know, comments like this coming out from away supporters who generally try to back and do some of the best job keeping the voice going in small grounds like this and being heard 
quite vocally in uh, usually in in most broadcasts. Like this is not super ideal. And then Nick, the his exact comment afterwards was that I'm not worried about his relationship with Chelsea fans. We need to accept this relationship. Someone asked me, do you feel the love from the fans? No, you need to build the relationship and you build a relationship through winning games. Accurate. I won't ask for nothing. I will continue to work to change and change this perception. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the larger that quotes fine. I just like it kind of, I think it shows the tension that he's feeling like he, I, I think if you're looking at like the, the full scale, like summer training all the way till now, right. You look at the full kind of scope of the season to this point, he has not been fully adopted by Chelsea fans. Like I think there have been moments where people have been like, huh, maybe this is going to be something. And then there have been moments where people are like, this is going to be nothing. Like there, there are, it's very fluid, the situation. And, I think the sentiment that you heard and could like viscerally hear on TV, which is a, <laughs> I mean, you, you really got to get a, a crowd worked up to, to do it like that. It, it's been bubbling for some time. I think the inconsistency in performance, the inconsistency in effort by some of our players, that sort of stuff really, really pisses everybody off. And, you know, you look at, you know, where we're going next. And I think this is the transition point. We're in 11th right now. And we just kind of have to accept that. Like we, Manchester United, who I think is complete and utter dog shit, is a full five places better than us. Spurs, we're 15 points behind them. Like this is, you know, I, I yeah, and I accept your premise that like result by result, you can make an argument for some progress, especially with how we played last year and how, how dire it, it truly was. But then you look at what I think is the weakest mid table in some time in the Premier League, trying to vie for the European places. Like every team in the mid table is flawed. Yeah. And you are no better than 11th in March. Like that, I think, is where people are concerned, including myself. Like, I think we just kind of have to accept that this is who we are. And yeah. by accepting that reality, it also comes with significant consequences because those consequences include not being first choice for transfers this summer, not being first choice if you do indeed replace the manager, not being first choice for any of this shit, you know, yeah. like. Other other feeder clubs may not want to adopt the blue co model because it hasn't proven out to be good. Like Strasbourg is struggling right now, even. So it's like yeah. I think this thing comes with a set of ramifications that haven't been truly realized yet. Well said, man. And like, how do you pitch this project to anyone to the fucking janitor, bro? Uh we talked about this in Discord. I was like, I would pay to watch Win Stanley pitch this to Zidane. Like, what, what is the Don going to think? Can, can about we get this? this on like a, uh, a Shark Tank slash dra Dragon's Den Look. type of experience? <laughs> that would be phenomenal. Look, I will pay to watch, pay to play. Hold I'm on. It. But yeah, that's okay, the so point. Like, what yeah. what is the pitch here? Well, the, the thing is, man, like, the, the, the pitch was meant to be freaking good before. Like, I was like, they must have had one hell of a PowerPoint because all oh, these guys were coming out like, yeah, this sounds great. The agents were going, okay, this legitimately sounds really good. Like they, they've got a wicked plan here. Go to Chelsea. Do you know what I mean? And, and loads in, was it Enzo recently that says, no, I joined Chelsea because they've got this great plan. I believe it's going to be awesome. Do you know what I mean? Like, so they had one hell of a PowerPoint, but that PowerPoint is getting weaker and weaker and weaker as, as these two years, because they've, they've done the epic pitch to two project managers, to Potter, to Maurizio Pochettino. They fucked up with Potter, right? And they're like, well, let's not do that again, guys. You know, these teething issues are really expensive. So let's interview Maurizio Pochettino for three months. Okay, let's sit down and iron out absolutely everything with this guy so we know we can't make a mistake and we're definitely in the long haul. Because when, And when that screws up and you have to, and you've done that twice in a row, you, you how are you still going to have belief in yourself? Bro, do you know what I mean? Like, you know, we may have hired best in class, these sporting directors. And look, in theory, it's intelligent. I back it all in theory, right? But in practice, it's it's been, it's like, you know, Nick, you've, you've rightly said there um, that, you know, 
everyone's going to be sorry I'm opening iTunes for some reason uh, how uh, everyone's uh, not going to be happy and yes you've got to be freaking cr- like you know respect everyone's opinion but if you're happy with what's happening right now then you know I don't I you probably got a pretty good life. Do you, know what, do you know what I mean? Like, so yeah, you don't have a whole lot of other worries. Around yeah. Yeah. You. But yeah. What I, what I want to just, just quickly finish on here a little bit. What, what I'm saying is the fans, because of course we're talking about the chance, uh, Pochettino's response to said chance. Firstly, the Chelsea support has been incredible, not just the match going support, but Chelsea have been incredibly patient and understanding uh, in what has been a turbulent two years now. You know, and this is a this is a fan base and a club that is notorious for relentlessly winning. A bad year maximum. So there's been loads of patience given, right? Uh, when the fans sing Jose Mourinho, or when the fans sing Roman Abramovich, they know Roman Abramovich isn't coming back. It's, it's saying, you know, we're talking about what we're used to. It's the same with Jose Mourinho. I think I'd imagine if you sat down and had a conversation with everyone who's singing Jose Mourinho, had like a big boy conversation, I think 75, 80% will be like, yeah, obviously don't actually get Mourinho back as a no, manager. No, please, no. But it's like, no. you know, but it's like, it's about what it what it represents. And if, if you if you just don't mind me just finishing my rent very quickly, I on Pochettino, right? Because I guess we're talking about the manager here, yeah? I never thought he was the guy, but I thought he could be the guy for right now, okay? Like, again, in theory, the young players, style of play, bridge the gap, get us up into the top six again. That's what I thought. The right? guy before and the I guy. I still kind of think, the guy before the guy, and I still kind of think that in theory, again, in non-practice in theory, I understand, this is me giving Chelsea a break, okay? Like, you know, why they did it, because it's easy to be angry and pissed off and say, I think they were terrible, but I want to like, play devil's advocate here so i understand it and i still understand it now but as the time goes on that sort of you know twitter rv account in me is like bubbling up thinking but maybe maybe he is just a a tottenham hotspur icon come to infiltrate chelsea and lower the standards and expectations of winning and change the culture to no no we just need to generate minimal revenue here and you know we just this is not the old chelsea it's not the old chelsea come on guys it's not and we go oh okay fair enough and before you know it five years down the line we go wait a minute shaking our fists like how did we get here but um I'm in the middle. I don't. I don't want to say I've gone down that road, and I'm a. You know, and I believe that we're being conditioned to accept failure because I think that's a bit silly. But this, and I, and I still believe he was an intelligent signing in many ways. But I think everyone, everyone involved, us here on the pod, um, Chelsea fans in the stadium, online, sporting directors, the football media at large, everyone's confused. Nick, I can see you're gonna. I, <laughs> so I, like, well, I'm. I made this point a couple of weeks ago because I think the conversation around Poch by a majority of the supporters, at least I see on Twitter, right? I think if you, you know, again, you have big boy conversations, which I, you know, I think we need to take that mentality forward and have big boy conversations more frequently. And I think we try try to do that on the pod, not always successfully. Uh, mm. If you saw my Twitter mentions from Thursday, um, but I, I think the. I think the larger point is like if you reflect back on this time last year, right, where Pot- uh, Potter was basically gone, and the club were looking for the next guy. If you're being truly honest with yourself, is between Nagelsmann, who at the time seemed like a really big risk slash personality clash with the with the hierarchy, and that's why it wasn't signed, and Pochettino, who had Premier League experience. And had a you know coaching of young players and all this sort of stuff, and I remember like we had multiple discussions with Matt and Naz about that you know during that period like which would be the better fit, you know Nagelsmann had clearly worked at the you know kind of multi club model system and the RB you know atmosphere and then went to Bayern which is a whole different big boy job. Pochettino had been at Spurs been at PSG and was maybe ready to to resume the Premier League experience, all that sort of stuff. I understand that people are upset with Pochettino now. I think when presented with those options in, in different ways, I thought Pochettino was the right hire back this time last year. Like, yeah. just me personally, because I thought that, you know, that Premier League experience was such a critical element. Like, you couldn't, if you were with Staley Stewart, Bully, Egbali, you couldn't afford to take the risk 
of an, another manager without that like pedigree, that Premier League pedigree. Mm. And so I went a little bit safer than I would have gone. I think that is just the reality of the situation. Like him or not now, that was where we were. Just quickly as well, because I agree completely, and I, I, I don't want to like dominate the space here, but just as well, because people are upset with the owners, they're upset with Pochettino. The owners, do you remember when Rain Group were talking to different potential owners for Chelsea, right? Ricketts and stuff. I don't know about Pegley or would, would he have been good or not, or the guys from Crystal Palace. Everyone was like, Todd Bowley, he's wanted to buy Chelsea before. He knows about the Premier League. He owns a successful big sports team, and they've got a lot of money, and it turns out they want to spend a lot of money on players. Everyone was on their knees for this. I was on my knees for sporting and technical directors and a proper sh- infrastructure. All of this is happening. A lot of this stuff is happening. Everyone really, really wanted and was happy we got. It's just not working at the moment and no one knows where to direct their anger. Uh, anyway, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll pass it to Brandon. It's <laughs> accurate. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Look, I think Luis Enrique had an ego. Um, yeah. Obviously, Nagelsmann had an ego. Bully and the sporting directors probably also felt like Poch didn't, and that was a big part of it. To mirror your um, you know, thoughts, because I think Ian, you bring a very uh fresh perspective, at least on this pod, ab- about that, right? The data does uh indicate though that there are concerns with the performance levels. And I have a couple of things to to pull here for us to talk about. Is it um one, uh, Chicago Dimitri put out the rolling non-penalty xg for and against i think a lot of you that if you don't follow him you should he uses data visualizations really well to kind of show where we're at so this essentially shows the difference in our xg versus our opponent's xg and what you want to see is our xg is higher than their xg obviously um we were doing really well in the beginning of the season even when the results weren't there but like the data would show we are out perf- we're out creating our opponents, which is good. That means we're creating things and we're limiting them, right? Very simple terms of offense versus defense. Then in United at early December, we fell off a cliff for that month. And I think we all remember that. It was a yeah. little bit of a glimpse with Palace, Luton, Fulham. But then since Liverpool in the league, we have been massively negative with even with Crystal Palace being like I close to the biggest spread where they were actually on top of us in that sense. And so since you know mid January we've been on another slide in terms of managing games, creating more uh l- eliminating opportunities for our opponents. And so Dan, I think one thing was like oh maybe a back three is a fresh approach to this. Maybe it was forced because of personnel and things like that, but um, this is one piece of it. And I will just push in two more things you guys can pull in if you want. One, we've played 30 different players in the Premier League this season. That puts us tied for the third highest. Nottingham Force has played the most with 33. Arsenal and City, who you'd kind of say are your top two teams in league, have only played 25. So that's a difference between squad, squad strength. And then average age in the Premier League by minutes, Chelsea are the youngest with 25.1. We are the youngest, but Arsenal are 25.5, Tottenham are 25.8. Then you get to Liverpool are 27, and so is United and City. So a couple other things to sprinkle in there as well, Dan. Yeah, and if you back out Thiago Silva for the matches that he played, (laughs) I bet that number drops pretty dramatically on average over the course of the season. I think the, the thought would be something like a back three switch for the remainder of the season would be that you have effectively 12 more Premier League games, one to two more FA Cup games, maybe three if you're super lucky. So you have 15 more matches between now, the beginning of March when we're talking, until the middle end part of May. And there are not many more periods where you're going to need to go three days in between games. You're going back to the seven-day breaks, eight-day breaks between matches. I mean, we don't play again until Monday, right? We played on a Saturday, so we get a nice rest for the players. I do think it's about saying, hey, I've got a player in Cole Palmer who has done really, really well, has, I think, outperformed most people's expectation for him this season, was able to produce a little magic out of nothing again in this match. Great from, from him there. You have Nico Jackson, who I know infuriates a bunch of people with his misses, but also scored a really nice header and is finding ways to stay on side a little bit more over the past few games and is 
progressing as a developmental striker this season. He is not the perfect article article, but he is, you know, pushing towards, you know, 10 Premier League goals, which would be a really good benchmark for him kind of in the start of a first full season as a primary striker on any type of team. And so I, I think they're it's about getting the right players on the pitch, getting Malagusta in a position where he can continue to assist, trying to find some way to get Ben Chilwell back into form. Like he has not necessarily played as well as we've seen him play before getting an opportunity to get Gallagher a little bit more forward, Enzo a little bit more for, further forward to take advantage of attacking ability that we do have in this side when they are refreshed, when they can play for a little longer and then figuring out who's that second backup option who can come in at 65 minutes to keep this squad fresh and pressing and high intensity, because like that is where this Chelsea side has looked really good throughout large patches of the season. And it is small mistakes and individual errors that have let Chelsea down time and time again this season. And I think to Jan's earlier point, like it's, it's a lot of people who are involved in making Chelsea happen on match day. It is players. It is a manager. It is technical directors it is an ownership group. And all of them have responsibility for what we see on the pitch. It is not just, one group of those who bears the brunt of the responsibility for our our results. We are there together uh, other than supporters. Supporters don't bear any responsibility for the result of what happens on the pitch. Um, But yeah, I I think back three would be interesting for the remainder of the season. It would be fun to see. Uh, It also maybe sets you up for many of the back three managers that people want if Pochettino were to leave. Uh, So I think this, I want to see, I want to see what Poch has. And I mean this sincerely. I want to see him do a coaching job now. You know your players are gassed, and you know that that high-intensity style that you want to play isn't necessarily going to be as effective because they aren't as fresh. I want to see you adjust your tactics. You know that you're leaking too many goals. I want to see you adjust your tactics. You aren't getting the best out of your midfield when they are playing and they are fit. I want to see you adjust your tactics. Like I want to see you do a job now because I think his status is pretty tenuous right now. And I think the only way to, you know, is exactly using his words is to build the relationship through winning, to show progress, to show that you are capable of doing this job at a really high level from now into the end of the season, whether that be 12 matches or 15 matches, whatever it is. So yeah, and I think that is my that is my plea. If anyone is listening, is like I want to see you, Maurizio Pochettino, make some hard choices in personnel. Mm-hmm. I want to see you make some hard choices in tactics, and I want to see it start to work. I want to see us not concede dumb goals anymore. Yeah, it's tough. Not conceding dumb goals is uh, real tricky. Of course, there's the story about the set piece coach coming in, which was done above Pochettino's head. Uh, which is a very telling, I think, in terms of perhaps he said maybe had a conversation. He said, no, he doesn't want that. And they said, oh, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And I think their excuse was it's for the whole club, for the development, for the women's team. But I think that might be a way of just negotiating. Yeah, we're getting a set piece coach here. Um, maybe an indicator that they are looking beyond Pochettino as well. Um, quickly, just uh, before I talk about the formation, uh, Dan mentioned keeping a back free. You know, I think you're inferring maybe a new coach that might come in and play a back three. Of course, there's a lot of talk about Ruben Amorin, the uh, the sporting coach with a massive buyout clause, by the way. Not going to get him. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I was going to uh, go go and say that. Um, I don't know if the listeners have watched that athletic video uh, assessing how Chelsea are at the moment, that um, analyst Euro expert, he basically broke down entirely how sporting play and how they're massively riding their luck and it's unsustainable in a lot of ways and how they leave their midfield massively exposed, but they can afford to do it in that league and that position they're in. And he's basically said, if he comes to Chelsea and plays like that, it's going to be an absolute disaster. He said, this is Chelsea's biggest problem as it is exposing the midfield, like Caicedo and stuff. So this will be tenfold worse if Amarine comes to Chelsea. So don't take my word for it, guys. Go watch that analysis. It's really interesting uh, for many people thinking, oh, he looks good. Like a young sort of, you know, good looking, angry midfield manager that can come and you know be the new Jose Mourinho for Chelsea I mean it's not it's not just vibes guys it's tactics as well so I check that out I, honestly I, in terms of formation for the rest of the season I, I don't really care whether it's a back three or a back four 
Um, I feel like something... <sighs> I'm so bored of turning points, you know? I don't want to ask for a turning point because we've been going around the roundabout all freaking season. So, But there is an element of just that something's got to give with the collective psychology of this Chelsea team. I've said it so many times. In a football match, there's a narrative, right? And you don't know that there's a narrative, but your unconscious plays a role, like the unconscious of the teams and players, and indeed the crowd as well, they play a role and they don't know they've been enlisted to a role, but they play the role. They're like, okay, this is how the game's going. We can all feel it. We're going to be these guys in the story and you're going to be those guys. And that's what happens in a football match. It's fucking theatre, bro. It's what happens. It takes a very special individual to pierce through the matrix and be like, bollocks mate i'm gonna like an Eden hazard so I'm, I'm gonna go against the narrative here in the grain and just do something we don't have that like magician who can pierce through the multiverse and change the story so we need to make sure that we just don't fall into this role of the passive you know vulnerable kids and that's tough man but that's that's where we are so it's not so much uh, the formation for me it's just some people just getting into the team like look guys don't worry about it don't worry about qualifying for europe we're not going to get relegated just go and prove, you know, like like Nico Jackson's posting, like some people were giving him grief about posting his goal on social media. Like, yeah, I scored a goal. I was like, I don't give a shit, bro. Like he's a 30 year old winger, Senegalese young man from uh, Villarreal that's playing as a winger that for some reason is playing at Chelsea, uh, which is great, you know, as a striker. Of course, be excited. You scored a goal in the Premier League. You're not this like, you know, figure who's going to come in to lead the Galacticos and win a title. Like we just got all be realistic about what, what we've got on the team. And then we've got young players that are excited to score a goal for Chelsea. I know it's like, oh, it's like he won a competition and now he's in the Chelsea shirt. But this is just what we've got. So I don't think we should be giving them grief. I realise I've just gone on a massive tangent there. But yeah, it's not so much formation, uh, Brandon. It's it's more like a psycho- psychological thing for me. Well, that's it. Look, we, we just got to manage the season as it is. If we're going to have a, a very injury prone midfield, even with Cassidy coming in, you need to switch your formation to go to two because you need an extra player to come in and fill, especially if you're not going to lean heavy on the academy players. It's basic stuff. So we'll we'll kind of see. And again, I think if you're hard to beat, which we've always gone back to, especially Nick, that opens up other things. But we are bleeding goals as it stands. Um, look, we didn't do Dan of the match or anything, but obviously Malagusto and Cole Palmer were the the two of no. Even Nico Jackson getting the goal, you know, covers up a lot of the the errors and things and him trying to do a step over and then letting it hit his heel and bounce away on that counterattack. Um, but, you know, I, I just think that one Malagusto, what a heads up by, right? Uh, bought him mid-year, let him come in in the summer, needed him, especially with Reese James being completely absent this season, which is tough. Um, I think, you know, he's a, a complete fullback, but his ability to get up and just be nasty and hates losing is is probably one of his biggest traits. So, I mean, Nick, if you want to just touch on Malo quick before we hit Cole. Well, I, I think just more, yeah, more than that, like Malo, Cole, you, you look at a couple of these guys who were bought and they aren't necessarily the highest price guys. They're going to make it. There, there's no doubt in my mind Malo Gusto is going to make it at Chelsea. There's no doubt in my mind that Cole Palmer is going to make it at Chelsea. I actually, I'm pretty high on Nico to, to be honest with you. Like, I, I, you know, I, I think for, for, for a guy who is again, not the most expensive purchase we've ever made and has been kind of pigeonholed into a starting striker slash winger slash, you know, second striker role this year. I think he's done just fine. Like he's been mm-hmm. fine. I think my biggest concerns are some of the other guys and that's, that's a bit of a tough one, right? Because I think if you look at like average performances across the squad, you know, there's there's some guys who clearly at this point in the season are on the bubble for whether they're going to make it. I think there are some guys who have underperformed significantly this year on average. But, you know, I think there have, you know, in the midst of all of the like, what is the project, all this sort of stuff, there are a couple of gems in here that were like, oh, man. You know, Malaguso is sick. <laughs> like he's actually sick. Like he's a really, really good player. Yeah, they just yeah. don't have the normal support around them, which is what we're finding, right? Is you can't have all um high upside players. Like at the end of the day, some people need to be reliable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's where we find ourselves. Mm. 
I'm just going to ask you quickly, guys, when you're talking about Mallow. Um, and Chilwell, I think, is amazing. And when he's good, he's transformative. And he can be a leader. He hasn't been. I wonder if James is to return quite soon, if we could see a world where James goes right back and Mallow plays left back again. I just wonder if we could see that happening for a bit. But um, so just well, a there, thought exercise. There were some wondering if Reese is right center back and Mallow's right wing back, if that's a combination. Or, yeah. you know, I think there's been this long standing belief that Reese James in midfield, you know, in one of those two mm. roles would potentially be transformative, especially if you know that your midfield's running on absolute fumes and you don't seem willing to put Trev there. You don't seem willing to play Cassidy, you know, yeah. your other two midfielders that you bought for backup purposes for those, yeah. for those exact reasons aren't healthy or available. Like, you know, again, it's you get the nothing has gone to plan. Yeah. 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 yeah, just wherever, <laughs> you know. That's true. You get the passing of recent midfield as well, and he's done it before. But yeah, we'll see. I mean, he's a leader, right? And obviously having him involved in a lot of stuff is important. So, uh, Dan, obviously we said no Dan of the match. We move on to other results. We just wrap up this very long weekend as the Manchester Derby is going on. Um, but uh, Everton losing to West Ham 3-1. to one. Fulham smacking Brighton 3-0. They seem yeah. to be on a bit of a run. Uh, Newcastle 3 nothing over Wolves. Forest just missing out. Liverpool, the drama was at seven, eight minutes of stoppage time. Liverpool scoring after that had already expired. No surprise there. Tottenham coming back to win 3-1 over Crystal Palace. And then uh, Villa squeaking out a win over Luton of all teams, 3-2. to Yeah, uh, would have been a good weekend to pick up all three points. That's for sure. Every weekend at this point is a good weekend. True. Well, we're through the Definitely. looking glass. We're through the looking glass now, boys, because Man United are winning at the Etihad. So, yeah. Uh, look, that's up. that's more for City's problem, I think, than anything. Uh, Bournemouth did beat Burnley at the early match as well. Um, the the table, you know, like I said, in the middle of this match as it stands, is is Liverpool top still at sixty three, Man City fifty nine. They are playing right now. Could go one point behind. Arsenal with 58 and Villa on 55. That's your top four still with Tottenham 5, United 6, West Ham 7, Newcastle 8. We dropped to 11th again, which is so frustrating when 36 points. Wolves ahead of us on 38, Brighton 39. The only silver lining is we have a game in hand, but it's Spurs, right? So it's not Luton. It's not Sheffield, right? It's Spurs. So it's not going to be uh, an easy three points. And at the bottom, Luton on 18th and 20 points. Burnley. 19th on 13 points in Sheffield and 20th with 13 points. You got a negative 44, negative 34 goal difference between those bottom two teams. Uh, one thing to call out, and I would I would only say this because I put a $10 bet on it. I think Forrest are in real trouble because they have yet to be given their judgment for uh, whatever the English FFP uh, version is. Profit and sustainability. It's yes, profit and sustainability. Um, the penis, if you will, uh, PNS. And I think the, um, <laughs> and, uh, I just Clip thought it. I'd get that in there. Um, yeah. I, I think if they get anything more than a four point deduction, I think Luton are better than they are. Yeah. Obviously so you're saying I. four points because that's the spread right now. Yep. So you look at them, uh, Forrest on 24, Luton on 20. I think Everton uh, could get dinged again too because they're a yeah, part of that could. second wave. Yep. Like that gets 16th and down gets super, super interesting. Um, and everyone was hoping that, you know, Brentford would lose yesterday in that, in that bottom five, because like, you know, all those points are just so crucial this time of year. So really interesting. Just wanted to kind of call that out. Cause I, I think sneakily Forrest are in a lot of trouble. Could be, yeah, definitely. They've had some good moments, but then I capitulate against. I mean, Sheffield players fighting each other on the pitch, like just put them down now. Like it's <laughs> they're one of the worst ever. Like that Sheffield team is one of the worst ever. And yeah. and they set that bar pretty low themselves a few seasons ago. So uh Yannick, the, the middle is interesting. West Ham still holding on somehow. Newcastle not really kicking on. I know they they won big at the weekend. And then even Wolves creeping up into you know the top half of the table, which are the teams we have to, but like Fulham are right behind us as well in 12th. Like the, the scary part for us is like if you if you put a run of two, three matches together, 
we can very quickly, you know, make up some of this ground, but like they're proving it to be wildly difficult. Oh man. I mean, th this is just the Brent, the Brentford game yesterday. Do you, the, the mood is so low, right? Because of that result. I mean, like the, the, it's, it's so tough, dude, because had, I, I know you've done it to death and I'm not going to go over it again, but had like just a little bit more nuts in one of, Conor Gallagher's shots in Wembley, the mood around Chelsea would be profoundly different from some sort of minuscule fleeting little thing like he slightly leans somewhere different, a goal goes in, we defend the lead, the mood around Chelsea is completely different. I was in Pochettino doing a good job with this like dysfunctional team winning a trophy in the first season and they might even go up the table now. That mood's not there because that slight moment in time didn't happen for us, which is, we've got to remember like, you know, and uh, I don't, I'm not looking at, I, for me, I'm just thinking, we're not going to qualify for Europe my, my, on the Premier League table. My main thing is, can these boys sort themselves out to get to a semi-final in Wembley and, like, you know, hope maybe you don't meet Liverpool in an FA Cup final. And then that's so you could... Because I think there's just a mental thing there, you know, like a bit of a sort of hoodoo there now. Like, can, even a Man City would be easier, I think, do you know what I mean, because of how we play. Can we do that? Can you you know, finish the season, win the FA Cup, because the Premier League, I just see us getting the odd result dropping down, the odd result dropping down. Can they summon these players, you know, these inexperienced players, but World Cup winners and, you know, champ a couple of Champions League winners, can they say, you know what, let's just fucking do this at Wembley and, and win the FA Cup because I've kind of given up on the league table. Not in a bad way, but like given up on like, well, obviously not a positive way, but not. I'm not hoping to qualify anymore. I'm just hoping, I'm like putting the team under a microscope. How do you play together? What's the mood? Do you have belief in our badge? Do you want to be at Chelsea? That's what I'm looking at now, this kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, rather than vet, the vet the squad from here on out. Make sure that you Absolutely. have the people that you need next season, exactly. right? And you need to send yeah. the right message to the people that you don't. Look, it's not a yeah. positive or negative, and it's a realistic view of exactly, the Premier yeah. League. That's how point. I feel, man. That's well, loved having you on, Yannick. Uh, obviously, people can get even more of you if uh, you're somehow unfamiliar with him. Like I said, YouTube, go check it out. Um, it's It's been far too long, but it's been fun staying in connection with you in the WhatsApps uh, throughout all this yeah, time, man. sir. So we appreciate you. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. I love coming on chatting to you boys. One day we'll win a football match and I'll come on and we'll we'll talk about positive stuff <laughs> exclusively. If only. So thanks if for having me on. we're going to have to... We're gonna have to hold you essentially on standby for a while, like just yeah, in case, sure, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, clear yeah. your no Sunday worries. mornings. Well, I'll be here, man. <laughs> so I look forward to what happens. Yeah. Cool, love it. Well, as always, we got more content coming at you uh, throughout the week. Get involved. Uh, get in the Discord if you need a family to hang out with throughout the week. It is a great space to be. Uh, but that's gonna wrap us up. So until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high. <laughs>